Thank you very much. That brings uh, us to the panel discussion. So I invite our eminent panelists uh, on stage, Honorable uh, Iran Vikramaratna, uh, of the Fraser Institute representative Fred McMahon, and our keynote speaker, Anushka Vijay Singha. And I would like to invite Vishnu Balachandran to moderate the discussion. He's the head of capital markets at Cal and Investment Bank. He's a graduate from University of Colombo and a CFA charter holder. He accounted for nearly nine years of experience in investment research and investment banking. Vishnu, over to you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I thought I'll uh, take a side on this uh, panel without creating a segregation between uh, two parties on the panelists uh, because we are here not for a debate, but to take a policy uh, view on how we can take uh, Sri Lanka forward on an economic uh, freedom angle. Uh, I had a lot of questions in mind, but uh, with Anushka's uh, address and uh, Iran's uh, response to that, I think most of it was covered. But uh, let me try and cover uh, some other aspects more on a policy decision. Um, and any questions from the audience, I would uh, appreciate if you can send it forward and keep it from a policy view as much as possible, uh, rather than uh, politicizing it uh, to a great extent, because topics of this nature can easily go off track and uh, uh, take a tangent from where we intended to be. Um, Fred, I uh, read some of your comments on the uh, policy audit, sorry, the economic freedom audit. And uh, just to take a step back, and uh, there were some uh, statistics provided on how uh, per capita GDP and economic growth had fared in more economically free nations. And uh, while there were so much of statistics put forward, just trying to check on the cause and effect, what causes and what was the effect. Uh, is it that economically free countries were actually achieving these kind of results, or had countries which had achieved certain amount of uh, results in these aspects, did they suddenly turn around and embrace economic freedom at some point? Uh, it's, um, it's economic freedom. Uh, is, it's economic freedom uh, that starts the, uh, the process. If you have a closed economy, if it's difficult for businesses to do business, uh, if it's difficult to hire or fire people, if you can't sell your exports to the world, in other words, if you lack economic freedom, there's very little room for growth. But you did point out something important. Once the path is started on, and once people begin to see the benefits, you get a snowball effect and it starts building on itself. You see gains in prosperity, poverty reduction, and you say, well, we're on the right path. Let's carry on. Which brings me to um, a slightly different uh, context. I mean, um, given where Sri Lanka is today, and uh, yes, there are obviously countries that high rank, uh, high, rank high on the economic freedom index, but given where Sh Sri Lanka is today, and you had judged Sri Lanka or the world on economic freedom on 42 criteria, but Given where we are today, do you think we are ready to embrace all these factors and work on a totally free economy model? Or where, based on where we are today, do you think there's so much of hand-holding that is required from a state's point of view to get us to a certain extent and then let us go free? Uh, I've never been impressed uh, by the uh, hand-holding uh, hand argument seems to me to be tremendously paternalistic. Uh, you poor people out there, you can't manage on your own. We need a, a heroic government. Wherever countries have moved to economic freedom or jurisdictions move to economic freedom, uh, the economy takes off. And it doesn't matter whether it's in Asia, uh, Africa, or South America. Uh, it's amazing the drive and ingenuity people have when they're free uh, to uh, to exercise it. Uh, and very often the best experiences are the overnight experiences. As I mentioned, New Zealand, uh, where they removed virtually everything all at once with the agricultural sector screaming blue murder uh, 
and all of a sudden the agriculture sector becomes a world uh, beater. Uh, Singapore was a swamp made up of different uh, ethnic uh, groups. You give people their head and all of a sudden everybody's doing well. So no, I don't buy the paternalistic uh, argument. Um. Aaron, I think uh, Fred has one answer to a question you posted uh, right now. We have 250 commercial entities run by, or close to 250 commercial entities run by the government. And uh, two questions I have to you on this. One is, why is it so crucial that uh, the state has to run these 250 commercial entities? I mean, we have essential services and all, but why is there the need for the state to be running these 250 commercial entities? And uh, secondly, a uh, slightly broader question is, you were pointing out about how the state was rolling out certain features for the country and state was in the need to provide for certain things. I think uh, moving into a more facilitator role, shouldn't the state be facilitating uh, 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 the private sector to function uh, in a more equitable manner. For instance, why does the state have to roll out ambulances if it can make uh, life and general insurance more broad-based? And uh, the private sector can definitely be providing the healthcare services, but if uh, life and medical becomes more affordable to the larger public uh, by the state facilitating it, why do you have to be rolling out these commercial services? So, see your views on it. Maybe I'll start with the ambulance. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll reverse the question and ask you, why wasn't there an ambulance service that the public could have actually used? Obviously, there are many reasons why there wasn't, you see, and uh, the state uh, ventured into it. I would make a general statement. I'm not for the state being in business. I'll make that general statement up front because I don't think that the state makes a good deal of it. But I would balance that by saying that in a society, right, in a society, they are, are the weak are there in a society. If I, if I were to put it in an, a, another way, there are the orphans and there are the widows in a society. And we have a responsibility to take care of those who are weak in society. That is our value, that is our culture, and we need to take care of them. But I will distinguish between that, basically the social net, and basically state getting into business. I'll distinguish between those two. And uh, I think the state need not be in business. The question is, we are in business. It's built over a long period of time. And how do we actually get out of it? We need to build a public debate, you see. It's not about state running things. I don't think the state actually can run things. It's making a mess of it by running it. I'm all for management transferring. I'm going even beyond that. And I'm saying that the state doesn't need to own things. But in the public conscience, ownership has meaning. And actually, people are being misled that you need to actually own something. I'll give you an example. When I was a boy, the state banks had a huge share of the banking business and banking assets. I remember as a boy, my mother going to the Bank of Ceylon, going to the counter, I would be in shorts, get a token, there was a bench, we used to go and sit on the bench, we used to play around while she waited till she was called. 30 minutes, 45 minutes she was called. That was the time in which the state dominated. There were very few foreign players then, few old British banks, but nobody else. It liberalized in 1978-79. Today, the state banks are only 45% of the total banking assets. I predict that the next 15 years, it will be down to 25% of total banking assets. And that the reason is the economy is growing, Basel III is coming, capital is needed, the private banks will have the freedom to go ahead and basically get the capital they want, even though the government has ownership in private banks. We will not use that ownership to block the plans of private banks to raise capital. So the private banks are free to do that because the economy needs to grow. And the state ownership of assets should be completely based on private return. 
and not on any other basis. That's what it should be. But if you look at that argument, the unions, right, uh, have this mistaken idea that somehow the ownership matters. What really matters is whether even the workers could get a better return and whether the country could get a better return. A public debate is needed on that to show that it is in their interests and ownership doesn't really matter. And here, I think we all need to get together to actually do it. Um, Fred, your views on it? Um, in terms of uh, the role of the government in uh, creating this transition and setting up this, uh, I would say, social network or the social base uh, to create an equitable environment rather than letting things go free overnight and let people sort out their own matters? Uh, I agree with the minister that not just government, but society as a whole has a responsibility to help the uh, worst off. Uh, and I don't believe that the optimal level of regulation is zero. Uh, that said, uh, the fact that some regulations are needed or the fact that we need to help the lesser off uh, becomes an all-encompassing excuse for the great and heroic state. If one regulation is good, a dozen are better, and a gross is even better. So one of the things that people like the minister fortunately need to focus on, uh, I say fortunately because I think uh, uh, the minister is very wise and knows a lot about public policy, is how to make the regulation as simple and as clear and as predictable and as minimal as possible to achieve these goals. As for social welfare, you have to be very careful not to produce perverse incentives that, uh, uh, that uh, do people harm by subsidizing this activity over that uh, activity. The best social welfare program is an open market and a job. Uh, and one of the big problems in Sri Lanka, if you're talking about social welfare, is the high level of dismissal costs, which makes it very hard uh, for people to join the formal economy and get a job, and thus they're shunted off to the side. So you have to understand that social welfare uh, can be advanced by the free market, not just by government programs, and opening up the free market to everyone, including those who are not so well off and those who lack power. Thanks, Fred. Um, let me try and touch, uh, based on some of the aspects that was covered in the Economic Freedom uh, World Index, and Anushka, I'm not going to keep you waiting for too long without taking one of these on yourself. Um, Forex uh, seems to be a very touchy topic in Sri Lanka. I mean, Sri Lanka has several restrictions in uh, individuals in Sri Lanka owning foreign currency denominated accounts, as well as the exchange control in Sri Lanka to some extent is seen as one-way traffic. We are focused so much on bringing Forex towards Sri Lanka, but uh, very close towards uh, having Forex go out of Sri Lanka. Um, and there is so much of drive to bring uh, FDI to Sri Lanka. Uh, just looking at the multiple uh, economic uh, indicators in Sri Lanka, we have low unemployment rates. At least on record, we have low unemployment rates. And then we have this drive to bring FDI to Sri Lanka. And uh, where does that tally meet? I mean, as a country with low unemployment, shouldn't we be more focused on driving GNP rather than GDP? And wouldn't that require substantial outward investments by Sri Lankan firms in the regional countries to grow Sri Lanka's income rather than uh, income within Sri Lanka as a demography? And where do you think uh, uh, forex liberalization could uh, help Sri Lanka on this aspect? Um, Anushka, you first, and then I would also pose the same question at uh, Iran on this aspect. Thanks, Vishnu. I think that's an uh, important question. I guess there's two elements in that. One is if we look at exchange rate uh, management, uh, 
And I think that was less part of your question, but I think it's important to, 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 to highlight the importance of having flexibility in that. And we're seeing the central bank uh, move in that direction, which is very important. It's a very important signal for both importers and exporters, folks in international trade, to understand the path that the central bank will take in terms of exchange rate management. And I, I'm sure most of us in the room will advocate for uh, that flexibility market determined. On uh, ex foreign exchange management, exchange controls, so we've seen a new um, foreign exchange bill, which is more of exchange management than exchange control. Uh, I'm not an expert on the, the actual final clauses of that, fi of that bill, but uh, I think it goes, it's progressive towards being, having a more contemporary, more modern foreign exchange management. Uh, during the national export strategy, one of the sectors that we're working on is electronics. And you'll be surprised at how many Sri Lankan electronics manufacturers and exporters are very keen and able to set up operations overseas. So they don't want, they're not giving up Sri Lanka because of any a particular business climate constraints or anything. I mean, they're, they're moving part of their operations, they're expanding for various competitive and, and business reasons. And they often complain out as to how hard it is for them to take money out. This is the same not just in that sector, we've seen it in apparel and, and other sectors as well. And those firms that are able to make a case for themselves are able to take money out and, and expand. Uh, but I, so it becomes very more, more, more of a bargaining and a negotiation uh, on that. But I think we need to stop vilifying those companies, those industries that want to go and sit up overseas, like you said, because we, we want to see more global Sri Lankan companies, more Sri Lankan MNCs, if you will. The other part in that is, and I think last year or so, we saw very regressive uh, policy action, and that was this export proceeds repatriation regulation, which basically said for, so, for some reason, the Ministry of Finance had been convinced that there was exporters stashing their money overseas and not bringing it back to Sri Lanka. That was hurt, hurting our reserves, which is kind of strange because our, the rates you get for dollar uh, earnings here versus keeping it in a foreign bank account would, I mean, to be higher here. So I, I don't see why f uh, folks would really keep that. And I, the evidence on that was thin. But still, we had this regulation that said within 90 days of your export order going out, you need to bring back your export proceeds, which was so, uh, so restrictive, so intrusive for business. A um, lot of industries that were competitive because of some of the longer credit periods they were offering were facing difficulties, particularly the folks uh, uh, like tea, who were in countries where there were already difficulties, like the Middle East, uh, et cetera. And it also affected those who were keeping their money overseas for a little longer to buy raw materials, to buy inputs from foreign suppliers. So there were a whole host of issues that weren't considered when this kind of export proceeds repatriation restriction was brought in. Finally, we managed to lobby to get it pushed a little more, and I think now it's 120 or 180 days, but it should be no days. We shouldn't be uh, making restrictions like that. Um, businesses should be allowed to make their decision. And to be honest, if there was a real evidence-based um, case put forward saying this is what's happening, these are the number of companies, this is some bad thing that they're doing, but that evidence was not uh, really convincing either. So I think these are some of the things we need to look out for, even as the government has gone, on, gone in for more um, modern exchange uh, management. Um, and your views from a state policy perspective on uh, liberalizing uh, exchange movement. I think um, as Anushka explained, most of this uh, uh, wishful thinking of the companies to keep uh, dollar earnings out of the country also comes from the apprehensiveness of, uh, I would say, the exchange control or the state to facilitate outward flow of uh, exchange as well. And uh, yes, making it liberal overnight uh, would have a shock on the exchange rate and the economy, but I think it would uh, stabilize at some point and create a more stable environment. And uh, where do you see policies moving in that direction to create a more liberal, uh, I would say, setup or plan uh, in terms of uh, foreign exchange? Yeah, uh, certainly, we would want to continue to liberalize. Uh, I acknowledge that there have been inconsistencies in policy 
and uh, that doesn't help businesses in particular that policy should be consistent and moving in the same direction. We could argue and debate about the speed at which the liberalization happens, but it shouldn't be go certainly moving in the other direction. So we are moving more and more to a more open, liberalized uh, trading, as well as more and more open and to liberalize capital flows. Uh, Sri Lankan companies investing overseas, we have the examples of the uh, parallel industry, Chandan is there, Vishakapatnam is there, the Brandix is there, Amante, the brands are there, and, and we would like to see a lot more of that happening. Uh, we would be supportive of it happening. Uh, I think the question that we often face is, as you said, every liberalization has an immediate impact and that has to be managed. We liberalize the exchange rate because we want a market-driven exchange rate rather than an artificially managed exchange rate that prevailed for a decade. Uh, very strangely, some businesses come to us and say that was better. Businesses, not, not, not policymakers, you see. Uh, because obviously somebody gets hurt, somebody benefits in any liberalization and that transition, there is a cost. But that's definitely the right direction to go in and uh, we will continue to go in that direction. You, if you wonder about the pace of liberalization, why aren't things happening sooner than it should happen? I would like to say this, it's not my fault, it's yours. Because governments act according to the mandate it has been given. This government is a coalition government. I represent the single largest party in the coalition with 106 seats, not even a simple majority. And therefore governments always have to act depending on their mandate. We have to carry our partners along. We have to convince partners who don't have sometimes the same philosophical and economic vision that we have in a coalition government. And I think that needs to be understood. Often older people come to me and say, "Why this is not like 1977. I said in 1977 we were still in school. And I said some of you were probably not even born. So this is not 1977, where you had a United National Party-led government with a very clear mandate, five, six of parliamentary majority, and subsequently a president, executive president too. We have never had those conditions since then. So this is a coming together of two major parties. And I think that needs to be understood in the economic context. That also has some advantages with dealing with some of Sri Lanka's bigger problems, which are the political issues the country is facing. We are a post-war country, not necessarily a post-conflict country. We are transforming from post-war to post-conflict, and that needs some big steps that need to be taken in terms of democracy, reconciliation. And we have done those things. We have to go much further than that. And therefore, the two political parties coming together, even though a coalition means generally building consensus, it's much slower in its decision making, there are benefits on the larger picture. Just uh, picking on a few aspects that you just addressed. One was uh, inconsistency, speed of liberalization, the mandate on which governments get uh, appointed, as well as uh, managing transition. I think uh, subsequent governments have come to power promising uh, state employment, salary hikes, subsidies and giveaways. I think uh, in economic freedom, most Sri Lankans like the free part of it, but not the dumb part of it. So taking it from there, I think we have close to 1.6 million in state employees, uh, whereas some form of research I've read has said that we could do with half this uh, volume uh, of uh, state employees. There's so much of buffer built in and the biggest issue most people have or most Sri Lankans have uh, found it difficult to digest is the fact that the administration is so politicized. Uh, I'm not saying it's only in Sri Lanka. There are so many countries where the administration is so politicized as well. But right now the biggest issue we also have here is that fact that the administration is so politicized that consistency of policies brought, the ability to carry it forward in subsequent governments, the ability to find continuity, uh, all these have been a great challenge. Uh, 
and this also adds to the cost of doing business in Sri Lanka. Uh, it's a very uh, difficult question to ask, do you see Sri Lanka depoliticizing the administration at some point? But how do you think we could address this to some extent? And if Fred and Anushka can uh, add some uh, views on what kind of cost implications it has in terms of making Sri Lanka a more free economy as well as the kind of cost it has added to doing business in Sri Lanka. Yeah, we have probably uh, next to the United States of America the largest public sector in the world. Public sector as a percentage of population. Do go and look at the calculations and see what I'm saying. Certainly the public sector needs to go down, whether it's at whatever level of government, from central to provincial or, you know, to local government. Uh, 1.4 million people, probably 400,000 in the armed forces and in the police, and about a million other employees. I think we all know that it's overstaffed. There's no question about it. The question is, how do we transit from that? You see, how do we transit from that? Uh, I don't have an answer to that question. How do we actually reform? But my general suggestion is that if the government gets out of business and we bring in basically it's our non-strategic assets are put on the market and we bring in wider ownership, I think it's one way it will resolve itself. Good examples, we have a port, we have container terminals, SLP 100% owned by us, SAGT 15% owned by the government, 85% by the private sector, CICT 15% owned by us, 85% by, by foreign parties, Hambantota 15% owned by us, balance owned by foreign parties. You have two ways of reforming. You can reform from inside, and you can reform from outside. My general view about reform, taking the political realities, create competition. And basically, that's one way you will bring in more efficiency through using competition, and you will erode it. Whatever sector you take, with the problems we have are generally in state monopolies. We don't want private monopolies either. But if we can create competition in those relevant areas, whatever area you think, whether it's energy, whether it's petroleum, whether it's a Ceylon Electricity Board, whether it's some other major sector, right? We have to create basically competition. Um, uh, Minister, I'm going to start with a small bit of good news. You aren't tied for the worst in the world with the United States. I think. Uh, Jordan is the worst in the world with about 40% of the jobs being part of the civil service uh, there. But it is important to emphasize the immense amount of damage and overstaffed public sector does not just to the economy, but to the society. Um, first off, as the minister mentioned, it politicizes the public sector. And that creates divisions in society and makes electoral campaigns more vicious because whether you get a job or not, the job that you want, depends not on the policy that you're supporting, but on the party you're supporting. This is desperately bad for uh, civil society. Secondly, if you have a huge civil service, you tend to underpay your civil service. Uh, Singapore may have one of the best, world's best civil service. It has a small, extremely highly paid civil service. The head of state, or the effective head of state that has the highest salary in the world is not the president of the United States, it's the prime minister of Singapore. When you have an underpaid, massive civil service, you encourage corruption. It's a recipe for corruption. If you want to figure out how to increase corruption in Sri Lanka, the solution is easy. Hire more civil servants and pay them poorly, 
because then uh, uh, you're forcing them, in effect, to support their families, to take bribes, to increase corruption. Third, the larger the civil service, the less efficient it is. It's not that with every additional civil servant you maybe get uh, a fraction of increased productivity. What you get is decreased productivity the more you hire because you have civil servants looking around uh, for something to do. And that something to do is often interfering in business or the marketplace or making regulations more difficult, the process uh, uh, more difficult uh, to, uh, to go through. Four, you create perverse incentives for people to want a civil service job. Um, that's one of the reasons you have labor shortages here, particularly at the higher uh, end. Now, I think another reason you have labor shortages is things like the firing thing, uh, firing uh, uh, regulations, because that discourages companies from offering really good jobs that will attract uh, uh, people. But uh, it creates problems for the private sector because the public sector is competing with the private sector. It discourages skill formation because oftentimes a civil servant simply needs a piece of paper from a university to get a job rather than really build skills. It can also undermine the work ethic uh, through a society. If you see civil servants not working, you wonder if you're, if you're at a private company why you have to work. The problems with an overly large civil service are immense and broad spread and societal as well as economics. And the minister's right. There is no simple solution. You just have to put your foot down. You have to say, no more uh, hiring. Uh, and make exit possible to private sector jobs. Uh, you can set up a program uh, where it's easy to carry benefits between the public and the private sector, or even get a bonus if you leave the public sector for the private sector. But fundamentally, it's a question of discipline and commitment, saying enough is enough and having the courage to step down on this because it creates so much incredible damage. Thanks, Fred. Uh, Vishnu, I think that's a really important question. Uh, and I think if we look at it in a few different uh, parts, the f one way of looking at it is uh, what's, what's politically possible and what's not, right? So, and I think that's just the reality we have to deal with. And in that, I think a, to imagine a scenario where even in a two to three year period, we slash that by half would be unrealistic to expect. And particularly when you have uh, the majority political party in power that followed policies like that, including a freeze on hiring a few years ago and got burnt, I don't, I don't think it's likely that uh, the government will go down such a route. But maybe we can do a few things at the margin, at least right away. And I really don't see why these need to be contentious. One is the military in business. I think this is deeply problematic. It seriously skews the business climate. I'll admit to you two things up front. The Navy run whale watching service in Minnesota, service, fantastic. Vessel, fantastic. So it's the best in the business. But we will never know if it'll, it's really the best in the business because it's so heavily cross-subsidized that there's no space for anyone else to actually come in and be better than them. So for the moment, yeah, best service that I can get, but that's, firstly, it's not private, and secondly, we'll never know whether it's the best. Same thing with the airline. Fantastic service of Air Force uh, flights to Jaffna, extremely polite. I mean, you almost forget that these are Air Force officers who are cabin crew. But it's the only flight in a country that's trying to promote tourism, promote greater connectivity across the regions, the fact that 
um, we have very limited domestic aviation options and that the military um, largely uh, runs, r runs that the Air Force is, is problematic. So I think those are the kind of things that we can do right away. Um, the other aspect of things we can do right away, which are politically feasible, link back to what I mentioned earlier. Some of those institutions that are supposedly working for a certain purpose, but haven't really been questioned on why. And I think this is where the chief financial controller of the government, i.e. the Ministry of Finance, has a really, is really nicely positioned to ask those questions. When these institutions come to the finance ministry and ask for budget allocations, tell me, what did you do for enterprises last year? Why are you asking for this money? There's, we can flip that onto the public as well, and I think the Asia Foundation did some of these at the local authority level on participatory budgeting, where citizens can come into the local authority and ask questions about where money was spent, what the spending priorities should be. Uh, should it be spent on more street lighting or on a new public cemetery at the local level? So these are small examples of where we can use little levers to make, uh, to make changes. Two other points. I think we might be one of the only governments that had uh, quite an ambitious and good e-government drive. So you're going digital, but at the same time, increase the number of public servants in government. You, anyone here in the private sector knows one of the reasons we go digital is to drive more efficiency and probably reduce your uh, payroll and reduce your headcount. Maybe as this digital drive accelerates and there's more being planned on e-government, this will be one of those ways in which you end up pushing people out and some way of cutting heads uh, because you know, these functions will no longer exist. Finally, we have to, I, I think, ask ourselves why we ended up hiring, Sri Lanka ended up hiring so many people to the public sector. One obvious e explanation is patronage. The other, which I think we may not always appreciate, is that it has served as a safety valve. Whenever there had been no jobs getting created elsewhere in the economy, public sector jobs were used as a de facto unemployment insurance scheme. So the two issues there, one, the fact that there isn't an unemployment insurance scheme or that why um, you know, it was used as a safety valve. The other is, why aren't jobs getting created in other parts of the economy? And that too goes back to restrictive regulations, can businesses easily start, uh, what's the cost of failure, can they hire and fire? And if we had that, we'd see a lot more dynamism and a lot more private sector jobs being created. Because if you really look at it, if you look at the numbers on the distribution of enterprises in Sri Lanka. 93% are micro-enterprises. If you add small and medium, it comes to 99%. And I think we have a problem with private, good private sector jobs being created across the country. That hasn't happened. Whether it's in post-conflict areas, post-war areas, or others, we just haven't seen that kind of dynamism. And part of it is because of some of these economic freedom issues, entrepreneurship, climate, and so on. So there are two aspects to this. You had this safety valve mopping up of uh, uh, unemployment through the, uh, uh, through the public sector, but also other incentives that should have been created, whether it's insurance, whether it's pensions, uh, all of these things that need to be happened. And to end on a uh, note to what Fred said, you know, you talked about exit, making it more attractive to exit. Over the last few years, it's been more so attractive to exit the private sector and go into the public sector because of the amount of hiring that happened. Yeah. Could I just add something? Because you brought up uh, something very important, that's military involvement in the economy. This is a huge long-term danger. As the military gets involved in the economy, uh, uh, they, uh, they become politicized as they protect their investments. Corruption rises, and in the long term, and I can name any number of nations where this has happened, in the long term, what occurs is you give the men with guns a reason to support a corrupt system and that becomes very dangerous. That's a long-term issue. I don't think you face it right now. Uh, yeah, we are, as I said, coming out of a uh, war. So we are in a post-war phase. And we have to manage the post-war phase very sensitively and carefully. We are also looking at the big picture in actually managing it. 
And uh, we are very clear that the military shouldn't be in business. We are looking at what the alternatives are. Uh, you raise the issue about domestic airlines. And uh, we are coming up with a policy, basically creating a framework so that the private sector could come into the space in domestic airlines. Uh, if I look 10 years down the road, I'm suggesting a second runway in Katunayaka, second runway. Because as the numbers keep increasing, the space needs to increase, more aircraft needs to come in, more terminal space needed. And then we need to put our domestic uh, terminal there. Because you come in the international flight, you fly anywhere you want. You can't spend two hours going across the city to Ratmalana to do that. That doesn't make any sense because your whole flight will be only 30 minutes. So why do you need to go by car for two hours to get onto a flight? Doesn't make sense at all. Now there are advantages in doing all of that because the moment you do that, right, the Air Force also can't operate from the same civilian terminals because, right, international law, insurance, and other reasons. So these issues are being tackled. They are being tackled in a very sensitive and with a, very with a clear view about the long term. The fact of the matter was that for defense reasons, even thousands and thousands of acres were acquired during the conflict. And those large portions of that, in fact, I sat in a meeting this week with the foreign ministry 90% of that has been freed by the military, you see. The question is, though it's freed, it's still not necessarily transferred to the original owners, and there are lots of complications there, but 90% of it. And we only have extended portions of land still in the Palali area, which we will uh, gradually uh, try assess as to what we need to acquire and what we need to keep. So we're very clear about the role of the military. We are very clear what their role should be in the future. And we are also very clear that we are grateful to those who have fought for the territorial integrity of the country and that their interests will also be safeguarded. I think uh, time is of essence here. And uh, if Dana permits me, just one last question. Uh, while I have so much of questions on, uh, I would say, free trade and everything, just one, touching on one last topic, which is uh, free movement of labor, I think. Uh, Labor shortage in Sri Lanka has been uh, repeatedly brought up, especially in the construction sector, the manufacturing sector. The country is invested in tourism, and we are not producing sufficient uh, trained uh, staff in that sector. And uh, why, why do you see a free movement of uh, labor as an issue? And I think uh, the minister highlighted that uh, the ability to bring down skill has been uh, now uh, short-tracked and the uh, permission has been granted to the uh, Commission of uh, Immigration. But then again, my question would be, why does somebody need the permission to bring down labor? From a policy perspective, do you find that as an issue? Because we are cre creating one corrupt position there where one person has the ultimate power to decide whether you need to bring down the labor or not. I mean, if there is a need for a particular skill set, why shouldn't uh, private enterprises in Sri Lanka have the liberty to bring down the skill set that is required to get the economy off ground? Uh, good question. Uh, if your industries think that you need lawyers, go get them. If your industries think that you need doctors, go get them, even from overseas. The question is not a question for government. It's actually coming from the professions itself. The professions, sometimes for good reason, and sometimes only for protectionism, are basically safeguarding their positions. So this is, government policy is not created in a vacuum. Government policy basically is created looking at the several industries, the several professions, right? And we are conscious of the fact that in some professions, you have to basically have standards, and those standards are not just international, but local as well, and requirements. We are conscious of that, and we respect that, and we respect some of the views of the professional bodies in that. But if we were to generalize the, the answer to the question, right, uh, 
Uh, as I said, when we give that list to the immigration controller, we won't have doctors and lawyers on that list. I mean, that's just an example. Maybe there are other professions that shouldn't be on the list. If we are made aware, we'll probably put those as, as an exceptions, basically not to allow, basically, people to come in. But where, to answer your question, where there is a clear shortage of a particular skill in a particular industry, it can be information technology, it can be manufacturing, it can be electronics, it can be something like that, then we want to make sure that regulation doesn't hold up and that it is liberalized. In terms of the answering that question in terms of the free trade, I will leave it to Anushka. Uh, so, Vishnu, I think there's a few issues there. One is looking at movement of labor in, in sectors like construction, agriculture, and tourism, where they're going to need large numbers, and you're seeing the industry already having expressed a need for it. Uh, that is where, where uh, I think, I hope that uh, both industry and government can get together to really figure out how to make it happen because right now it's happening anyway. It's happening on tourist visas, it, it's happening through informal channels, so it's happening anyway because the industry needs it and they're finding a way to bring it down. Um, I think before there could be either any abuse of that system or a backlash from local parties, we, n we need to regularize this and by that I don't mean you know finding ways to stop it or you know silly regulations but just formalizing this so that it just makes sense, it's within a agreed framework, and these industries are not going to be hampered by a lack of labor. On the, uh, on the trade angle, uh, the minister is, is right because what has really held this back is not the trade negotiators or the government. Successive governments over the last few years have had major problems with getting the professional services on board. Uh, I remember I was, a, I was an intern working for Dr. Kalegama at IPS when the SEPA negotiations first kicked off many, many years ago. Uh, and the last memory I have of those consultations was all the professional associations saying, don't open up, we need to get our house in order. Fast forward to 2016, when the discussion started again on the ECTCA and so on, my first memory of those consultations were, don't open up, we need to get our house in order. So between then and between back then and last year, what were these uh, professional associations doing? But I think as long as there is a narrative that free trade is not going to happen or preferential trade agreements are not being pursued, it's easy for folks to just sit back and you know, be comfortable in the privileged position they've got. Preferential trade agreements don't do a great many things. They do some things, they're not really free trade. But the one thing that it does do is that it anchors your reforms. Everybody has to anchor, uh, it, it anchors the reforms to a particular time period, to a particular agreement. It gets people who weren't doing something to do something now. So now you're seeing the message going out to all these professional associations and others saying, hey buddy, this is happening. You better get your house in order and you better tell the government what you need done um, for, for this to happen. Um, I think the final point I make is that there's a broader issue here about how Sri Lanka, how open Sri Lanka is to global talent, outside of individual sectors, outside of it coming through agreements and so on. Um, I don't know enough about, enough about this to, to make a convincing case or make a really strong point, but I think in general, all of us would like to see a Sri Lanka that is more open to international talent. Colombo International Financial City is necessarily going to need that kind of uh, talent. Um, but I think we need to get ahead of the debate before we have folks who misunderstand what, what being open is about and shaping the narrative first. We, Advocata, all of us who believe in this, need to get in there first and start shaping that narrative about why we need to be open. Your job, you know, it's not going to affect your job. This is going to be people who don't exist in Sri Lanka who are going to probably take us to a higher level and make you prosperous as well. I think we need to get, get ahead of this and uh, shape that debate. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. And I think uh, the last few questions answered some of the, uh, one of the questions that I posted to Fred uh, right at the beginning. Is Sri Lanka ready to open up on all aspects uh, of economic freedom? And I think uh, one thing that was brought out was that uh, we need to get our house in order, but uh, we also need to set timelines and work towards those timelines towards getting the house in order so that uh, 
we are ready to face the world and the world is ready to face us as well. So while we might uh, be working towards moving in the right direction, I think uh, uh, getting the house in order and also working towards the timeline, I think would be of uh, most essence. Thank you very much for your time and views and over to you, Dana.